Another thing that we don't think in the graduate school is that all the knowledge comes from a bunch of professors. Um, your colleagues are an invaluable resource. And because of that, we ask a uh, graduate student organization to invite three of their peers to come and talk to you. And I'm going to introduce all three of them at once. That will keep me from running back and forth so many times and holding up the procedures. The first student who will talk to you is Alina Bennett. Alina is a, came to us after graduating in 02 from Pitzer College of the Claremont Group and then getting a master's in 08 from Ohio State, both those in women's studies and gender studies. She came to us then <clears throat> and started in 09 in the medical humanities. Alina has taken advantage of some of the opportunities at UTMB. She, even when she was pursuing her, pursuing her PhD, she entered the MPH, Master of Public Health program, and actually, technically last week, um, had the MPH degree bestowed on her. She's still working on the PhD. Um, that'll take another year and a half. No, May. 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 <laughs> they, they, um, I have learned that practically no one ever surprises me by finishing earlier than they say. <laughs> so I usually give them a little leeway. Uh, then, Tiffany Mott. Tiffany is a member of the Microbiology and Immunology Program. She works on vaccine development. She came to us in, um, in 08 uh, after graduating from UC Davis. And finally, Bill Miller, or Ryan as he prefers to be called. His name is Bill. He gets mad at me for calling him that. <laughs> Came to us also in 08, 08 from Wake Forest University in North Carolina. He entered the BBS, BBSC along with Tiffany that year. He is in the neuroscience program um, doing addiction research. And Ryan is going to finish this fall. Hopefully. <laughs> right. So I'll ask Alina to come up. My name is Alina Bennett. I am a master of the public health and soon to, be, soon to be joining the ranks of all of you super smarties with their PhDs in the room. And I'm so happy, I'm so happy that you're all here. I have such a deep sense of gratitude for this place. Um, and I believe that that same spirit will be cultivated in all of you by the time you are standing in similar shoes as I am. So uh, one day, Alice came to a fork in the road and saw a Cheshire cat. Which road do I take, she asked. Where do you want to go, was his response. I don't know, answered Alice. Then said the cat, it doesn't matter. Alice's Adventure in Wonderland, as written by Lewis Carroll here, I think, I think the real issue here was that because Alice didn't know where she wanted to go, there was no set path for her. And this theme sort of continues throughout the story. We're sort of stumbling into all of these environments with wacky characters, trying to sort of discern the appropriate path for her amidst all of these um, sort of archetypes of people who, people and things who just seem very odd to her. But for me, Alice's trip to Wonderland is really about a trip to a different kind of Wonderland. So this is what I'm envisioning here. Something more along the lines of kind of wonderland. Right. <laughs> Stay with me, people. Um, <laughs> so what I mean here is a journey into one, right? Into one's self. I think that that's really what was happening for Alice, right? She was taking this journey through the recesses of her own uh, sort of self-discovery. 
And I think that even though the Cheshire Cat asked Alice, you know, where do you want to go? Uh, he was really asking, who do you want to be? Because the answer to that question will tell you which fork in the road to take. And this is how I discovered the big lie about graduate school. <laughs> I tell this story because in all honesty, I didn't really get grad school. I really thought that getting a PhD was all about becoming an expert in a particular field of study. Okay, perhaps that actually is part of getting a PhD, but that is not what getting a PhD is all about. Developing expertise through schooling is the sort of predetermined process that makes it possible for us students to become something, right? And this, and it is this becoming upon which I will focus the rest of my speech. But I bet this is not news to any of you because I'm getting a very sort of cerebral vibe <laughs> from you all. So I imagine that you were much smarter than I was when I sat in your seats just a few years ago. So perhaps I can offer a few insights. Uh, a few lines back, I mentioned graduate school is the process for becoming something. So today I want to offer the claim that graduate studies is about becoming whole, becoming integrated. Integrity comes from the Latin root integritas, meaning entire. So it's in this, it's in this bad boy back, back here. Get ready, we're all going to recite it to you. Um, so perhaps over the course, oh, so you're familiar with this, this use of the word, right, meaning entire. We've seen it in words like integer, right, it's a whole number, right? Over the course of your academic careers, perhaps you've heard the word integrity launched at you like a golden professional grenade, showering you with moral shrapnel full of expectation regarding your appropriate conduct. And while I can understand and even support, as I do, this note behind me, I can in fact support such a use of the such a rhetorical use of the word, I want to offer you today a re-envisioning of that term. So in my years of study here at UTMB, I've come to believe that the function of graduate school is to help, help us become integrated in new ways. In practice, integration is made possible by doing work that honors your values. Values represent an ongoing life direction, and the educational environment is uniquely suited for getting clear about one's values through the practices of learning, questioning, and reflecting, right? So this is what Dr. T is talking about, this Platonic history, right? Socrates, Aristotle, right? This is the familiar line of teachers educating each other and mentoring each other, becoming sort of the great thinkers, right? And although, you may be right, Dr. Finger, in fact, we do not offer any anthropology courses here. If you're interested in taking a philosophy, an ethics course on philosophy, it's available through the medical humanities this fall. <laughs> so if you want to read some Plato, it's absolutely available with Dr. Carter. Um, so, uh, so this is why I argue that the big lie about grad school is that we're here to do stuff, when actually, I think we're here to become stuff, right? The kind of stuff that we uh, aim to become has one primary characteristic, that even though we're all coming from all these very delightful fields that are not totally 100% the same, there is one characteristic about the kind of stuff that we are here to become, and that is wholeness. It hangs together, and there's a completeness about it, about the stuff. And if we become the kind of stuff that is whole, I believe that this has a protective effect against the potentially erosive qualities of graduate school, including stress, negativity, and of course, fear, which according to Frank Herbert, right, the author of Dune, fear is the mind killer, right? So integrity of the self protects us against these potentially alienating forces by aligning our actions with our values. Instead of a generalizable testament to our education such that anyone with our similar preparation could do such work, our labor then becomes a novel extension of our values. As one who is currently dissertating, can be scary, uh, I can promise you that getting clarity on how the work honors your values is a critical element for success. So in closing, look at this, how scientific I'm about to be. In closing, I will leave you with the words of Galileo Galilei, right? You know, the man himself, hey, let go of that Ptolemaic version of the solar system, and let's go with the Copernican model, woo! Hey. Uh, in closing, I will leave you with his words, because I believe Galileo, I mean, I don't know him, but I believe that he supports my theory of graduate education. Right? as an education of the self. So here's what he says. He says, we cannot teach people anything. We can only help them discover it within themselves. <laughs> <laughs>
made a presentation. Um, I'm a very visual learner, so um, here we go. So before I'd like to start, these are my opinions of graduate school and not necessarily the opinions of UTME or the graduate school. But um, what I would like to do for this talk is I would like to skim the surface and convey upon you what is graduate school, what to expect, who the key players will be in your graduate school in, uh, education, and a little bit on how to survive it. And I only have 10 minutes, so I emphasize to skim the surface. So, and how I want to do this is I would like to use a uh, book, The Inferno, mm -hmm. and um, as an analogy for graduate school. So, I'm not saying graduate school is hell, but, <laughs> although sometimes it might feel like that, but there's some uncanny parallels between Dante's journey through The Inferno and your journey through graduate school. So, the book opens up. And here we have Dante. So Dante is traveling through the woods. He's lost his path. And now he's wandering fearfully through the forest. He's alone. He's in a place that he's not familiar with. He's scared and wandering aimlessly. So does any of this sound familiar? My first question. <laughs> so on our journey, um, this represents mostly the first years. And looking back, this is exactly how I felt. So not only mentally, but like physically. Um, for the majority of you. Some of you have been here, like the prep students, or those who work and then became graduate students. Um, it's not as daunting, but in my experience, I traveled here from Virginia. I didn't know Galveston. I didn't know where the grocery store was. Um, so, yes, wandering me in the street. I didn't know anybody. It was all by myself. I wasn't so much scared, maybe a little, but it was more intimidated and I had this anxiety. So I think that's a perfect symbol for our first year students. So our next main character is Virgil. So Virgil is sent to Dante from Beatrice, who is Dante's wife in heaven. And what his main purpose is, is he comes to help guide Dante back to his end point, which is this mountain. But the only way that he can get there is he has to travel through hell. So, and according to my English professor, uh, Virgil's two main things are, one, he's guiding Dante, and two, he provides companionship, so Dante doesn't have to go through this alone. And for me, in my opinion, this represents, once again, um, the students. So the companionship, your first-year students, those ones that are going with you through this journey of graduate school, and also for guiding your, uh, I could say, more your senior students. And upon this pack, I can't emphasize this enough that your students, your senior students, are your most vital resource. It's the one that has helped me the most through this journey. So guidance, for example, it's really kind of uh, daunting that you have to not only go through all these classes, but you have to pick a lab, you have to pick a research project, and there's so many variables, how can you narrow them all down? will ask a senior graduate student. They are the ones that have all the information on, you know, I guess, putting you, um, how should I say, helping you find a lab or find a mentor that's going to, you know, benefit you um, in your life's work. So, and not only that, I mean, you can ask your professors, but it's been a long time since they've been a student. So your students, your senior students have a unique perspective and can give you some insight that maybe faculty can. So, um, and there's two other things. The students, not only the students, but also, you know, some other techs in the lab, like really get to know the people who are around you. They can act as your savior. So for example, more times than I'd like to admit, you have an experiment, you have looked over all the variables, you've optimized things, you've ordered everything you need for it, and then you start to do it and you figure it and you'll find out that, oh, I forgot to order an antibiotic or I forgot this uh, specific antibody. And I've been saying more times than not by going to my fellow students and my fellow techs and saying, oh my god, do you have this antibody? Because I've done all this work and I'm at the very end and I really don't want to have to face that you know, face-melting look of disapproval from my boss. <laughs> so, and I've been saying more times than not. 
So, and in addition, um, your fellow students are going to play a big role in your work-life balance, which we'll get to um, later. So, we have our two main characters, so let's begin our journey. So, Dante's journey takes him through hell, which is depicted as nine different circles of suffering, which are designated by different sin. So, our journey through graduate school, in my opinion, we have nine different circles of challenges. And these um, ones that we're going to have to face in order to reach our destination, our, our endpoint as PhDs. And so, in my opinion, these are mine. So, first you have your classes. Then you have your lab rotations and research, student seminars, qualifiers, funding, candidacy, committee meetings, publications, and dissertation events. <laughs> so, and um, now, depending on your journey, your circles might be different, but these are mine. And uh, I remember during the first three circles, uh, I wanted to actually categorize them as over the whole. Because I remember being back when I was in these circles and thinking, oh my gosh, these curriculum committees and these course, uh, course instructors must be certified me saying if they think that I can take all of this information that I'm getting, process it, being able to test well on it, while doing laboratory rotations, while going to student seminars, while making my own seminar, while, you know, and then trying to fit, you know, life into it. But um, from where I stand now, there is a method to their madness. This, your workload, it's not going to get any less, but it does get easier because in this few circles, this is where you learn your time management skills. This is where you learn how to balance your education. So I was really mad. I'm like, how can they do this to me? I have no life. But this is what they're trying to do. They're preparing you for, you know, I guess your end journey, which, you know, if you look at the sins on Dante's list, you have some of the, their sins, but they're not so bad, and as you go down the list, they come to really serious stuff. Your classes, it's not so bad, but once you get down here, it's a little bit more all-encompassing, so you need that, um, that training, that boot camp, in order to survive some of the more um, <laughs> serious levels. So, um, Let's see, what's next? Okay, so we have our two main characters, uh, Dante and Virgil. And basically the point of Dante's journey is recognition of sin. And how you recognize sin, in order to recognize something at all, you need to be informed by that something. You need to witness, observe, or study that something. And then you need to be able to retain so that you may be able to distinguish it in the future. So how Dante does this is he journeys through these levels, and in each level Dante encounters either one or more sinners. And what the sinners do is they inform Dante of their earthly lives, the sins they've committed, and a little bit about their respective circles of torture. And while he's learning about this, he's also seeing the consequences of so, can anybody tell me who the sinners are in our stories? Our graduate school. Who are the traffickers of information? Who gives us all the information and the tools we need to navigate through our history? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know you don't want to say it, so I don't. So, um, I see these as our professors, our administration, our staff. So, they try their very hardest to provide you with all the information and the tools that you need to make it through this journey. And how you use that information and how you use your tools will um, show on how successful you can navigate through these levels. So Dante gets to the very end. And I see this as the last circle of hell. You have Satan that's frozen in a bed of and it's funny because from my perspective, looking at my dissertation defense, it was even overwhelming when I first started. But like Dante, yeah, it's almost kind of scary, but he is trapped in an icy lake. He's not going anywhere. And Dante has all this information that he's received from the previous circles. So basically, he just needs to travel around Satan out of his reach. No big deal. Climb down Satan's back, and then he's on the mountaintop 
where he's greeted by an iron circle of angels. So, um, and this is how your dissertation defenses. <laughs> In the fact that as you go through these circles, you're equipped with the tools, you're equipped with the information, and by the time you get to your dissertation defense, it's more of a formality. Um, and then commencement, you get your PhD, the angels start singing, and you're ready to go on to the next, <laughs> the next circles. So, um, so how to navigate through this a little bit more successfully is work-life balance. So, this is traditionally what I see as work-life balance. And when I look at this, I look at it and I'm like, this is not realistic. I don't know anybody who can do this. I know people that come close, but you work a little, you have a little life, you work a little, no. My work-life balance, when I first came here, was like this. I would work or work a lot, and then maybe take time, but like I said, there's always something in your queue. And I would never really take out time for me. And so this is what I ended up looking like. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a little background on this. this um, we were taking pictures for my boss because he likes to introduce us at the end of the talks. And this was like the sixth picture they took of me. I'm like, I am trying to work here. I'm trying to be into my experiment. I don't want to mess up. They're just one more. I'm like, okay, take the picture. So out of the six that were taken, this is the one that my boss uses. In the <laughs> so, so my advice to you on how to change your work balance, because this is what worked for me, is that, and I need to categorize by us, have three different friends. So I have friends like me. I have friends like this, where they're so smart that they work a little bit and they have a lot of fun. Some people can do that. I can't. And then I have a friend like this. She works hard and plays hard. So from what I learned from all my three friends, these are the tips for maintaining the work-life balance for me. So build in downtime or life in your schedule. And that's really hard for me to do. I might be a little hypocritical because I don't do this all the time. But just taking an hour to watch Dexter or you know, True Blood or something allows your mind to rest. So an hour later, you can get back into your study. Um, and it doesn't have to be an hour. It can be a 15-minute bath, whatever. So whatever works for you. Drop activities that sap your time and energy. And it's not only activities, it's people as well. Because I've encountered this with me. There's some people that just suck the energy out of you. Um, try and stay away from that. Um, other activities. When you're in the lab, don't go on Facebook. Don't go on CNN. Yes, I'm a little bit hypocritical of that too. But if I think about it, I could have got out of the lab an hour, an hour and a half early if I just stayed on focus and stayed on point. Um, rethink your errands. Now, this is one that Dr. Herzog he used to be here and he used to teach one of our um, student life skills class. He used to um, talk about this as far as, you know, when you're doing your grocery store shopping, don't go during peak hours. You know, go during the middle of the day when nobody's there. Um, I actually have friends, it's just me, and it's hard to cook for one. You know, you get all these recipes, and then recipes are right. So, me and some of my friends, on Sunday, we make recipes, we divide them up, and boom, you got all your meals for the week. So, uh, those are some examples of rethinking your hands. Getting moving. Um, exercising, like Dr. T said, it, you need to find some kind of release for all the stress that you incur, all the anxiety you incur, you need to find a release for that. And working out is one for me. And you'll see on my last slide, which I apologize because it's probably not as professional as um, I would have liked it to be, but it gets the point across. And then five, know thyself. As far as the work-life balance, I can work and work and work and work and work and still be fine. But then I need to take you know, a huge time. So just know your limits and know your boundaries. So after I combine all that, this is my work-life balance. <laughs> so it's not as consistent, but it's balanced. So and these are the examples of work-life balance in Galveston. So, I mean, and I um, threw some stuff from Galveston and Houston that you can do. So the top uh, left is basically Houston. They have a big gala every year for Halloween. You can dress up 
and you go down there and they open the um, Museum of Natural Science, Natural History, and you go around and look at the errands, and it's a lot of fun. They have booths and stuff like that. Galveston, because of the Mississippi um, and all the soot and stuff like that that feeds off the river, it makes it great for fishing, so go fishing. Um, the Mardi Gras that they have here, take advantage of that. Um, Dickens on a Strand, um, that was a lot of fun. Although I spent like three hundred fifty dollars on an outfit I only wore once. <laughs> um, Houston has a lot of these uh, runs that you can do, the color runs, tough mutter. Um, and you're trying to be extremely intimidating, but we look just really cheesy. Um, another thing, if you can't get out of the lab, what we do is we have a fantasy football league in our lab, and once a year we try to go to Houston to see the, you know. Houston Texans play, and I'm a 49er fan, so I insisted we went to the preseason game with the 49ers came on. So, um, on that note, um, that's a little bit of my advice to you. If you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask your upper level students, because it really does boost their egos. So, um, and on that note, um, I would just like to say I didn't mean to scare you with Dante, if I did. Um, it's not hell, but it is hard. It's the most, doing this PhD is the most exciting thing I've ever done. It's also the hardest thing I've ever done. And it's the hard that makes it great. It's the hard that makes it more rewarding when you go get your PhD. So um, I wish you guys all luck in your journeys. And like I said, if you have any questions, just let me know. I love what Tiffany did with Dante, it's just great actually, I'm very fond of the comedian. I, I just want to remind all the graduate students here, uh, uh, Dante's trip to six days, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure. Right? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> First off, I'm in Tiffany's Fantasy League, and you're going down this year. <laughs> Second, if I stumble when talking today, I apologize, but I've been up since 5 a.m., so I would have time to run a large cohort of rats through operant conditioning before speaking. Welcome to science. <laughs> I'm, here, yeah, you're right. I'm here to speak with you today about the most important decision you will make over the next two years of your graduate school careers, and that is how to pick a lab. Now, picking a lab is a lot like finding the right person for a long-term relationship. You both have to have that initial spark and interest in one another. You both have to genuinely like one another. You both have to be willing to commit. You both have to have each other's backs and demonstrate patience, because this is science, and trust me, you will have experiments that fail, more often than I like to admit. And also, you need to have someone that can pay for you when needed. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and keep this short and sweet, but the bottom line when picking a lab, it's the same as in the long-term relationship. The two most important aspects that keep it going and that keep you going with your PI and with your lab once you're in there is honesty and communication. Now, when I say honesty, I mean you have to be honest with yourself to know what you want in your lab, what your habits are, and whether or not that will work with the lab you want. Are you a morning person like I apparently am? Are you more 9 to 5 or are you late night? There are some labs here that are very 9 to 5. The majority of people work from 9 to 5 in that lab and they expect to see you at least during part of that time. Or <clears throat> there are other labs, such as Dr. T's, that I remember the first day I rotated in his lab, he, he brought me into his office, he gave the same Plato speech, he gave me a large stack of papers on Alzheimer's disease to read to discuss potential projects I could do in his lab. And then he looked me dead in the face and said, as long as you're working in the lab and producing data, good or bad, because I know it's not all going to be good, I don't give a damn what your hours are. And I really like that. <laughs> Uh, you also have to be honest about whether or not you like the people in that lab. Uh, 
another lab I rotated through. I, I liked everyone in that lab, but everyone was Chinese and spoke Chinese all the time. And I was literally in the corner by myself, lifting my head every 15 or 20 minutes. When they talk, I don't know. So I knew it wouldn't have been a good fit. Uh, this leads into communication. Uh, you have to find someone that you can talk with as a PI. So different people coming from different backgrounds, there's different styles, different uh, eloquences. You need to find someone you can talk to. And me, I think you can already tell, I'm a very straight talker, very open and direct, and my PI is, and I love that about her. Uh, sometimes it can be a little annoying when she'll look at you and say, you need to pick this up. But I'd rather have that than someone who doesn't say anything, and then a month or two down the road says, well, why isn't this working? I'd rather have a direct, up front, let's go. Also with communication, when picking a lab, uh, Tiffany mentioned this, you need to speak to everyone. So not just that PI, but other PIs, senior graduate students, techs, postdocs, everyone. Something as simple as, hey, I'm thinking of so-and-so's lab, but what do you think about that? This is the project I'd be on. And if a good majority of people look at you and say, oh, that lab, why would you pick that lab? That might be a red flag for me. <laughs> so, in, in conclusion, uh, picking the right lab, uh, there's no roadmap for one person that's the same as another. It all boils down to what you want uh, and whether or not this lab is, quote unquote, the right fit for you. Thank you.